Ladies and gentlemen, creator, executive producer, and showrunner, Matt Walpert. And then someone with a sim similar creator, executive producer, and showrunner, Ben Nadivi. I hope I pronounced that right, Ben. Executive producer, Meryl Davis. Creator, executive producer, showrunner, Ronald D. Moore. And then perhaps some actors you guys are familiar with. We have Ren Schmidt. We have Chris Marshall. And then I believe we have someone named Joel Kinnaman. Uh, I have a ton of questions, uh, but first I really want to uh, point out to you guys, uh, so please raise your hand if you got on a plane to come here. Wow. Or if you drove Thank really you. far. <laughs> Did you drive really, anyone drive really far? Oh, I see some hands. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm so, I really want to give a huge thank you to Apple TV Plus for partnering up, for you guys for all coming here tonight. Uh, as everyone knows, I love this show. It's one of the best things on TV. I'm, I'm thrilled that everyone got to see it on a movie screen tonight. And uh, I remember, please, no like live streaming or spoiling this for people who have not been able to see the finale. We would hate to do that. Um, so I got a, a few questions. Here we go. Uh, in what season might, and Ron might have heard this one, and maybe, perhaps, uh, in what season are we going to get a starship? <laughs> you want to take that one, Ron? <laughs> oh, it's coming. <laughs> but we're not going to give that away. We, we need many more seasons out of Apple, so it might be a while. Uh, I am curious, is it possible that For All Mankind is the prequel show to the eventual Star Trek type show on Apple TV that takes place like 100 or 200 years later? And this is like how we've gotten there. So it's like, do you see where I'm going with that? Uh, I'm happy to announce the, the, uh, that Apple has ordered many series from all of us. <laughs> no, thank you, Steve. So, keep pushing. I'm gonna keep, uh, by the way, I'm gonna keep going on this. Uh, I put on, uh, on social media that I was gonna be doing this tonight and something that actually a lot of people kept asking is, and I, I really mean this, what Star Trek series exist in the For All Mankind universe? <laughs> this, I'm actually not joking, a lot of people ask this. Somebody just asked me that recently because I guess we, there was an episode uh, that just aired uh, where uh, we said specifically there were three Star Trek shows. And I think, and you guys correct me, the last I counted, I thought we were saying it was the original series, Star Trek Phase Two, which was the show that never happened in the 70s, and then Next Generation. And that was our counting. That's right. That's right, David Weddle. <laughs> I would imagine, how many people, actually, for all of you, w like, uh, come up to you and talk to you, but like, like a Jeff Bezos or an Elon or like NASA people, like this has to be something that all the people who are interested in space travel on this planet are watching. So have you heard from any of these people? Do you hear that they're watching it? I don't know why Jeff Bezos isn't coming over to our houses every day and asking. <laughs> yeah, I, he sends boxes. So. I, I check my, my inbox every morning, but there's no emails from Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk in them. But, but we have heard that a lot of people at NASA, and we just heard today, like people at ESA and other space agencies are huge fans of the show. And uh, honestly, it's really gratifying to hear that they're enjoying it. You guys have talked about how you have a six or seven season plan or an idea, uh, which is what you pitched. So I'm curious, um, how can you give some examples of how the show has taken turns that you didn't actually expect in that original uh, outline, if at all? Or is it all going according to plan? I will say it's weird from the beginning. I mean, one thing we all talked about, and I know the guys talked about when they were creating this was that Ellen was going to be president. I mean, that I was kind of surprised stayed because something, sometimes when you're talking about things in the beginning, things like that kind of fall by the wayside. So actually, I have to say from the original plans that Matt, Ben, and Ron kind of were talking about, it's kind of stayed to plan. 
Yeah, no, it's interesting. I think a lot of the big moves have have stayed pretty much as is. But like, for example, I think originally Molly Cobb was slated to die in a fiery plane crash in episode 106. And we were like, we can't do We cannot do this. This is too good a character. So we there are definitely moments where we adjust uh, when we're seeing something good is happening. Was asteroid mining a part of the plan even back way back when? Yes, it was. Um, <laughs> everything was planned when we were kids. We dreamed this crazy show, and it's amazing. It's all no. I mean, I think that roadmap. You know, it was really early days, and I think we knew. I mean, Gene Kranz gives this speech actually in episode one, that really lays out that map that we kind of laid out in our minds. And you know, it's we've tried to hold to it, but at the same time, we allow ourselves some, you know, some leeway with what we're seeing is working or not working. But yeah, this season. I think the asteroid belt, reaching these asteroids and mining them and being able to maneuver them was such a, you know, when we found out what is possible and even reached a point now where you're seeing this happening in our real life, like people are really dealing with asteroids. And so it was exciting to finally catch up to kind of what's happening right now with science. And it was definitely one of those seasons that, that kind of stood out as something we were looking forward to, to kind of doing. Was it wasn't NASA like celebrating that they just like crashed into an asteroid? I, th I thought that was a little underwhelming. They just like <laughs> crashed into it. <laughs> they could have done a little better than that, right? It was. Uh, this is actually for the cast. You guys have been with the show since the beginning, and I'm curious how much were you told before it started filming about the ultimate arcs that of the characters that you play? Um, well, it, it's pretty close to. Uh, I think we, we in our first conversation we did talk about like a, a five uh, season arc. I didn't have a deal for a five season arc, but uh, we were very aware of that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, uh, but yeah, it, it, and, and this sort of it, it for me it's like kind of uh, astonishing how how much of that initial conversation that we had has actually you know, come into play. Like the, the, the original vision for the show is, I mean, like, you know, there are little things I'm sure that, that changed as you mentioned before, but it's like pretty close to that conversation, which is kind of crazy. And I was the exact opposite. Um, I was only slated to do three episodes in season one. Um, I was, I'm, yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> you want to talk about not having a deal in place. I didn't have a deal in place. <laughs> And like the little uh, hanger on that I am, I just hung in there. I clawed my way like coos on that asteroid. You can't get rid of me. They, uh, they, uh, they applauded when you were alive. I was like, that was good. Uh, I, I didn't know where it was going, but I, it was very clear with Matt and Ben and Ron and Meryl. I was like, I don't want to know anything. Just I, want to, I would love to see the scripts when they're ready. So, like I said, For, uh, I want to continue with you guys. Uh, what was it like? At, one of the things that I love is that about each season is you're progressing in these people's lives. And for all for the three of you, what is it like getting to play characters where you actually are experiencing their lives? And also with this season, playing much older versions and inhabiting that and having to do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it was, you know, that was the the really like fascinating acting challenge with this job and uh, and it was a little frustrating in like season one and two because it doesn't really start to come into play i, I felt like you know in the season three then you really start to see the aging and it becomes something that you get to start to play with but then in in season four then you know that's when when you really get to the to the juicy part of it um, I mean, I hadn't, I knew it was going to be a bitch, but I didn't, uh, I didn't understand that, you know, I was going to have a 1 a.m. call time <laughs> and then have someone just stabbing in my eye for six hours in the morning and then have a 13 hour work day uh, for six months. <laughs> so so that, that was, that was definitely a, a challenge, but, but it's, uh, I mean, it's really fascinating to get to play these ages, especially in in a series, because you know usually when you play this you know this much older um, as an actor, it's usually in a sort of epilogue scene of a movie. But to do it, you know, in a whole, for a whole season and for seasons of a show, you really get to do this die. 
Someone wants me to shut up. <laughs> um, you know, you really get to spend time with the with the idea of, of being at that age and what aging is and, and, you know, what it does to you, what it does to your confidence, what it, you know, and it's fascinating. And it, it, it's, it really goes to the core of what I love about what we do is like when we, we get to play these different roles, we get to try out these different, uh, you know, leather, human leather suits. And, um, and you get more empathy for, for people around you and, and more understanding because you just spend that much time thinking about it. So, so yeah, so that, was, that was, has been a huge gift with, with this experience. It was such a privilege to get to play over that period of time. But what was interesting, at least on my end, was this season felt in a way like starting over. You know, whereas in the past it had always been NASA, but NASA like step two or three or four. And this year, I like honestly, when we were starting, I was terrified. Like I've never been so terrified in my career of how do you take on 62 in Russia, speaking Russian, <laughs> how has she changed? She doesn't have the same, like it was just literally felt like other than kind of like the essential core of who this person was, everything else was different. Um, and trying to figure out how to navigate that and over the course of six months, I mean, there were just days where it was really hard not to let the actual terror of that take over me. But I also think in some ways, the fact that there was so much, there was just a certain point at which I was like, you just gotta stop thinking about it and just do every day, just do. So I don't know, I felt like the first three seasons in a way it was about how the relationships had changed and the confidence that comes with rising through the ranks in this season, I literally was just like, holy sh shit. <laughs> I don't okay. know if you guys okay. felt that. <laughs> but that's what I felt this year. Yeah. I, I think you need to, you know, continue to take jobs that scare you this much because yeah. that's what, that's, you know. Yeah. Um, for me, I haven't, um, you know, Danielle was always the youngest of the uh, the ASCAN group, and so in in last few seasons she was in her 30s and 40s, and this year she's in her 50s. So there wasn't as much of the physicality that um, that Joel and Ren had to go through, especially with the makeup and things like that. Um, but what I did find really freeing is that, oh man, you know, it is tough and also really boring to be an actress in Hollywood and feel like you have to stick with all of those like is she skinny? Is she pretty? Does she have fine lines or wrinkles? All those sort of things. And it's exciting to play a character who does have lines in her face and does have wisdom in her eyes. What you got to say? Because I can see. I was just saying, yeah, she did. She, yeah, had, she had them. Yeah, yeah, you got, okay. <laughs> but it was his makeup, of course, but she didn't, she had them. <laughs> Yeah, the aging was not a challenge. Working with Joel was my challenge. Uh, I'm kidding, I love you so much. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's fun to have the sort of shackles of that boredom be off and just be able to play and have this woman who's uh, acumen for business and her intellect for science and her inquisitive mind, like these are the reasons why she's in the room, not because she's youthful or beautiful. So. Um, getting to tell Danielle's story for the last four decades has just been a treat. And like these guys said, it's not the sort of thing that you come across in television. And it's just like, just so delicious. Like, what a joy. So obviously a lot of us, uh, we love the, the way science is depicted on the series. And I'm curious in the writing process, are you sort of like, how does it actually work in the writer's room and coming up with these ideas? Are you sort of like doing the story and then like, working out the science later or like how does this you know equation work how does it work yeah yeah i'm still trying to figure that out honestly no we we um always try to have a very open uh blue skies approach to brainstorming and so often what we'll do is we'll come up with what we think is a really cool and really scientifically accurate idea and then our advisors will tell us how there are things like the laws of physics and, <laughs> and things like that 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 are, prevent that from happening and so but then we have a conversation and so things like the duct tape suit come out of that conversation because we were like well 
can't somebody just go out on the surface of the moon and like run for a minute? And he's like, no, they would balloon up in like two seconds and die. And we're like, okay, well, how then how could they go outside if they don't have a spacesuit? And so that process, well, if they had to make something, a suit from stuff in that room. And so it was, it, that's the fun of this is being creative with people who know a lot more than we do uh, and um, discovering things as we go. One of the things I'm curious about is what I love is watching them figure out how to solve a salute, like solve something. So, for example, in the finale, when they are out on the ship and, you know, the thing, the, I forget the name of the device, but when they're pulling the yellow and the black thing, uh, like talk a little bit about coming up with these dilemmas they have to get through and working out like, you know what I mean? Coming up with the, the stuff that keeps the audience going. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, we, we try to, because Ben and I are, are fairly simple-minded people, really. <laughs> Speak for yourself. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, I think, I think, you know, there's yeah, that's, something that's about, like, experience the, today. <laughs> <laughs> but there's something about, like, a switch has to be in or out, and there's all this other complicated stuff around it, but, like, everybody can understand that, sure. you know, and, and, but there's drama in that, or, like, something's getting closer to the line, and, so I think we try to build things around, you know, complicated situations that brilliant people have to solve. But at their heart, there's this really dramatic, simple idea behind it. I think we're like, you just gotta shake it a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, part what happened this year, which was interesting, you know, the show started in the '70s, and you know, our our researchers they were basing things that were that were developed or real science. Whereas we're getting as the show continues, we're dealing with more theoretical ideas. So we found ourselves many times where, you know, the writers, we argue all the time, but now the, our tech advisors were arguing with each other as well <laughs> over like, what could it be? Because, you know, I think that's where the show is going. It becomes more science fiction. And I think that challenge is keeping that gra the grounded nature of the show in a world that's less and less familiar. Hence starships. <laughs> just, just saying. So I am curious, and I'm not sure who wants to answer this one. Over the four seasons, for each person that wants to answer, uh, what has been the most challenging scene or sequence to pull off in whatever episode, whatever season? I'll go first. Um, the fuck you scene in episode 405 with Danielle and Ed. Um, I wouldn't say, hmm, I don't know if challenging is the right word, but it was just, it was one of those days where I felt like it required every iota of energy in me to do it. Um, I've said it before and I'll say it again, like, Joel is just so much fun to work with. You really are. Um, that was not what I thought you were going to say. <laughs> yeah. No, it's true. And I think that, um, you know, you can't do this alone. You can try to do it alone and you'll be bad at it, but it's better if you do it together. And there's only so much that you can prepare and rehearse and, you know, you do your work at home, but then you have to come into the space and just play with the person who's across from you. And... Um, that day was a long day. It was a taxing day. Um, I mean, there were times when I was so tearful, the neck of my shirt was wet. And then other times where it's like, you just do a version that's really subtle and muted and you feel like there's nothing there. And there's just so many iterations of that scene that could have played and could have lived. And um, that was really challenging in the best way. And I'm just, I feel really proud of that work that we did that day. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that was probably one of my favorite scenes of the season, but definitely not the hardest. Um, to me, it's, it's hard when it's like not really working. And, and that was working. That, that was, um, um, so what wasn't working? <laughs> Who can I throw under the bus? Like, <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't really remember. Well, difficult. I don't, I don't know. It was... We'll pass over you it's to pretty the next. easy. Yeah. Yeah. Everything was easy. <laughs> I mean the, the challenge was more in you know, in the more it, it was it was challenging to not just yell at everyone all the time. Cause it was like just going around like spending eighteen hours in this like silicon coffin in your like your your face is in a coffin of silicon. And then every second someone is poking you in the eye. Like it's oh my god, it's like if I hadn't like found meditation before the season it would uh, it would probably be my last season in my career because <laughs> i would have done something really bad it was very hard mentally. No, and I, I will say that. Again. Yeah. so you're saying you're gonna sign up again 
What's that? You're, you want to do it again? Oh, yeah. Like... Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's a oh, the reality of that just dawned on me. Some, oh. Somewhere out there in the great beyond, Michael Dorn is laughing. Yeah. <laughs> laughing. He's like sipping a glass of wine in Australia somewhere. I'm so happy. <laughs> I think it would be like a toss up between. Um, so the scene in the, well, the scenes in episode six in the um, storage room, that was just me by myself with a couple of blank monitors and our crew. So that was like both really challenging and also kind of fun to figure out, like, how do you navigate that? So many pages where you're not actually getting to react to much. It's just somebody it's it was Brian. Brian was reading with me, Brian Relia. Um, so that was both difficult and fun. Uh, and then I just feel like the whole Bulgaria shoot of it all. We shot for Bulgaria in Bulgaria for three and a half weeks. And I've just never had that many scenes back to back to back to back where it's just all day, almost every day. So that was really challenging for me because the thing that's nice, I, well, depending on what your preference is, is in our show, we have an ensemble. So everything's kind of split and you might have like a couple of hard weeks if you're heavy in that episode but usually you can take a break and that was just like a sprint. I mean, it was like a, a nutty, nutty sprint, um, but it was really, really great that we had Svetlana um, Efremova on our team and we had these six incredible uh, crew members that came with us and then Matt and Ben and yeah, it was actually a lot of fun in the end, but still, I don't know, that's not like a sexy answer. But <laughs> Yeah, uh, I would say like the most challenging and one of the most rewarding p times on the show was working out the season two finale mm -hmm. because it was so, there were so many moving pieces. You know, you had missiles flying, you had the Soviets and the Americans going to the brink of nuclear war. You had people shooting each other on the moon base. You had people running around in duck suits on the moon. Sally Ride's about to shoot <laughs> Ed Baldwin in the head on the space shuttle. And it was trying to figure out the rhythm of that and the timing of that, and they were both on the page and in editorial. And it was like, it was very intense. And it was a lot of things to keep moving and to make it flow in a dramatic way where you kept holding your breath and then like, oh, oh no, and then something else would happen and getting to what the finale actually what it was. And when it all came together, I just thought it was a beautiful, beautiful piece of television. I mean, it's kind of hard. I mean, when you look at all of the seasons, I mean, I just, I always kind of go to the space suits and, and the gravity issues. And, and certainly in the first se few seasons or couple seasons, I think that was the most challenging. I think the actors could probably speak more to that about the space suits and their lovely feelings about it. Um, well, especially but, the season three <laughs> Teletubbies. Uh, it was very hard to take each other seriously while, while sitting around and like, we're all a bunch of Teletubbies. I think the space suits this season, though, Esther, our costume designer, um, created an amazing suit this season. And what was interesting about it, kind of to what Ben was saying, is beforehand, we always kind of were basing things off prototypes or things maybe NASA was thinking about but didn't use. But then this season, it was kind of just kind of, what are we going to do? Because there wasn't a prototype. Um, so I think Esther created an amazing suit. Um, with Matt and Ben's input, obviously, and I think the actors are probably happier this season. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. The, the season one was, was, that was... Gruesome. Yeah. I mean, the, those I mean, suits we were 70, they were like 70 pounds. Yeah, but, that's yeah. really, really yeah. heavy with the boots and the helmet, 70 pounds, so it's heavy. Yeah. Poor us. <laughs> <laughs> Poor actors. Yeah. Actors really suffer. Yeah. It's really ben hard. And I, ben such in solidarity, little. Ben and I wore spacesuits every day that they had to wear spacesuits to set while we were sitting in our director's chairs. Do you guys want to uh, touch on anything that was difficult? Do you want me to ask you, you know, something No, we else? don't complain. Yeah. We enjoy. We are you're living our dream. It's all been bliss. And that's what we Total, tell ourselves. Total, absolute bliss. Every day is a gift. <laughs> Well, I'm an, I want to ask some specific stuff, which oh, please do not put online until after tomorrow night when we're filming again. Uh, but I want to talk about the way the season four ends and that I love that shot of, you know, Eddie on the on the surface and it pulls back and then eventually it pulled in 2012. And that whole thing is a plus. So talk a little bit about how long it took to come up with that shot and how you wanted the season to end. I mean, it was really tricky. I think we you know, there were so many dark things that happened over the course of that episode. And so we kind of wanted to end on this 
note of hopefulness and idealism and sort of, you know, Deb is seeing the fruition of of what he he and his team worked uh, uh, so hard to bring to reality, but it's also what um, you know what Margot talks about in the viewing gallery. It's it's um, that is that symbolizes the future of the space program and the fact that they have committed to building out those um, mining facilities. It's just a symbol of how much the world is going to change going forward, uh, and so I think that's a really exciting possibility for the future of the series. I want to do a follow-up, if you don't mind. I love that I was studying that the, the mining things on the asteroid. I've watched it like three or four times. Just that shot, and it looks the best the way we all saw it tonight. Is there anything for fans they should look for in that mining shot with the cranes Ooh. moving and everything else? Oh, you're talking about a little Easter egg, aren't oh. you? Yeah, I, I, I'm I just curious if, if people we, should yeah. look for anything well, in that. I don't, if you want to look, you can look. <laughs> There may be something there. I won't commit to it, but uh, yeah, yeah. Just if you squint real hard. Uh, I listen. I know that uh, if hypothetically you are able to get another season, how much is that last shot with those mining things on the asteroid? How much is that a major thing if you get to continue the show? You know, there's always <laughs> those flash forwards we do. It's funny because as much as we plan, okay, this is what we don't really know what the next season's going to be. So a lot of times we end up having to back into that shot um, in many ways. So, but in this way, we did feel we knew a little bit about where we want the show to go with that roadmap. And I think that last shot conveys really what Matt was saying. I mean, how amazing it is the road this show has been on and this alt history that we've reached a point where this colony of hundreds will now become a colony potentially of thousands. And that this asteroid allows that to happen. It allows us to not only colonize Mars, but go even further. And I think that's really the, the beauty of that shot and the symbolism of, of what it represents. Yeah, but where are the aliens? <laughs> Joel has been obsessed with aliens. I'm not kidding you. Since day one. He comes to set every time. He's like, I mean, is it too, it's too early? I feel like it's, like, Joel, it's not this show. It's yeah, not the answer is no. Yeah. Starship. <laughs> with aliens in it. I, I am curious for, for the cast and for, for everyone else. This is a very emotional season filled of ups and downs, and I'm curious what it was like reading those scripts for the first time and seeing what was gonna happen, especially in the finale. Like, I loved hearing the audience here. You could hear them and then reacting to when they saw you, um, you know, survive. Like, there's a, anyway, I'm, I'm just curious if you guys could talk about the scripts, because the season was fantastic. Um, I think part of the really cool concept of jumping ahead in decades each season is that it means that we get to know these folks for a whole lot longer. And I think that, you know, I think about that moment in season three when you and I are in the outpost and you've been given the command and then it's taken from you and then I've been given the command and there's a sort of back and forth and there's the top text of this command. But the beneath that is the subtext of someone who was once the junior and he was a superior and you know he was the one that i learned from and now at later on we become sort of uh, even steven and then later as you see in season four we become adversaries in many ways and we can't earn that in normal time we can't earn that in a single season you can't earn that in six months or in six years you earn that kind of payoff in this relationship between these two people and so when we see in the midst of this riot Ed and Danielle see one another and there's this camaraderie of like, I don't care what we've been through. The two of us are in, in peril and we got to stick together. It's just, it's, you can't put a, you can't put a name to it. It doesn't exist in traditional storytelling. And that's been fun and really cool. And it, it, it can't, I've not seen it done in other TV shows. I feel like, again, I'm kind of shit for answering this question because my season was so different from theirs. It was like Margo was in timeout, like timeout, timeout, timeout. But I actually had a realization tonight watching the episode, um, which was as Margo's being led out of NASA, I just thought out of nowhere, she's free now. Yeah. She's finally free. I mean, of course, we know she's going into a cage, but you know what has been built up for the past three seasons. I just had this moment of relief for her, of, but I didn't. I didn't necessarily see that in the script. I saw it in the all of the components of our show coming together. The, you know, the scripts going to you know 
all the way to being on set and then you know the sound that gets added in and i don't know it really i feel like was the culmination of all of the pieces together and total sidebar <laughs> Jay and Barbara, who do our VFX, are so legitimately incredible. That's and seeing your work up here is just here. amazing. Amazing. Stand up. The <laughs> asteroid stuff and the ships. Those two, yeah. Woo! I, I have to ask, at, at any point when you guys were writing the finale, did someone who was working on it say, how the F are we going to film this? The director did, yeah. <laughs> and honestly, as we were writing it, we were like, how the F are we going to pull this off? And, the, and just watching I'm like, how the F did we pull that off? It's, in, it's, insane. it's an insane episode. <laughs> but it's great. I mean, it's it's amazing. Uh, it's no, a lot we, of fun to see. Now we dread the finales because we know what's coming. We just know, I mean, the buildup, like Ron was saying about season two, but I feel like every finale has kind of been, you know, all the threads of the season come together. And I feel like at the end, we're left with, we're like, okay, we've got to bring this together. And, and you know, like Ren said, it's interesting. I, I do feel it's that moment where everyone comes together, not just the writers, but I feel like the actors, the, 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 the music, the visual effects, it, it's really, it feels like the entire crew comes together for that finale in a way every season. And so while this was terrifying, in many ways, when we looked at what we had to finish, I feel like by this season, we feel like, okay, we, we're going to get there. I was going to something else, though, is you obviously, you may, every show is made on a budget, and you have um, some big moments during the season. So how do you figure out where and when you want to deploy the added resource, the, the big resources, like big VFX shots or big action or whatever it may be, because you have the you know the ten episodes to like how, where and when to deploy those assets. Seth Edelstein, you want to stand up? <laughs> Our line producer up there, who is a huge huge part of making this show a reality, and is an amazing yeah. partner. And it's and it is you know one of those ongoing discussions of just like do we want to start big and then kind of you know, suck away our dollars sort of for the ending. We always know the ending needs to be big, so we just have to kind of, I think one of our goals is to try to make each season feel different in the, in the like, the flow of the story, so we don't want everyone to be expected in terms of how the the epic moments come about. Uh, we're, we're just about out of time. I've already been given the wrap-up, but I'm pushing a little f more, and hopefully they don't hook me. But I'm, I'm just curious for the cast, is it fun playing someone that you completely disagree with when they're doing something or do you enjoy like relish when you are getting to play someone that you strongly disagree with oh i, I, lo I love when ed is a terrible dad <laughs> uh, it was my favorite scenes <laughs> and, and, and even when he's a terrible granddad oh i love it <laughs> so fun yeah it's <clears throat> it's frustrating i mean matt and ben can tell you i wrote a strongly worded email in season three when danielle basically says to will tyler like don't be gay now um it was awful it was so awful and i was so frustrated because i've grown to know and love and feel like i am danielle and for her to um, stand against him and reprimand him for coming out it just infuriated me and i wrote them an email and said i'm not going to do it this is not what Danielle would do, and you, you're wrong, I'm right, so fix it. And they were like, cool beans, no. Um, and made me do it anyway. And I am so glad they did, because it ended up being really beautiful. You know, real people sometimes do the wrong thing. They do the wrong thing all the time. And that is what makes her a human being and not just a character on a page. So yeah, all the time, I disagree with Danielle. <laughs> I think actually something that Matt said to me when we were, I can't remember if we were filming or if it was like a meeting, but he, he was talking about like the push pull of when you get to like the place of having worked together for a while and you know, you don't always necessarily see eye to eye, but there's actually sometimes something really interesting that comes from the, I don't know, like the debate or kind of the like that friction of being asked to do something that you don't think is is right. And those are honestly some of my favorite moments in the season. I mean, just to give you guys a little 
clue as to what I'm referencing in the elevator when Margot and Sergey's fingers kind of intertwine. That came from that friction. Because I was like, she'd never risk it all for a snog in the elevator. She would never do it. Uh, and I actually think that that's like one of the most beautiful moments in that relationship because I don't know, it was just, there was just so much to it. And I never would have come up with that on my own. I feel like that was because we had like a conversation about it and some push pull. Yeah. Uh, well said. This is my last thing, my last, uh, because again, I've, I've been given the wrap up signal like 16 times. Um, for this, this audience is filled with diehard fans of the series. So I'm curious. Hi, Bob. Right. <laughs> so I'm curious for whoever wants to answer, what do you think super fans of the show would be surprised to learn about the making of the show? It is a, uh, it's a curveball, but here we go. I mean, obviously that Joel hates being in makeup. I think <laughs> we've learned that. Just prosthetic makeup. That's, that's the only the other makeup I love. <laughs> I mean, I think it's sort of back to what, what um, I was talking about before with Molly. There are, there are these moments where that just come out of these these brainstorming sessions, like, you know, um, Gordo and Tracy uh, were a part of the show beyond season two in our original conversations, and we we kind of actually in the middle of that season we sort of came up with this concept of what if Gordo goes back to the goes to the moon to get his wife back, and it was like this romantic gesture. And that led to this idea of, of this tragic but insanely romantic death. And we did not want to do it in any way because we love those actors and those characters. And we knew that because our reaction was that way, that it was the right thing to do. And so that's something that I think, you know, there are a lot of scenes that we talked about in the early days of the writer's room of, with Gordo and Tracy in, in this world that, that because we came up with this interesting idea that was so powerful, uh, those scenes, you know, are now in the ether of, of the world. I was just going to say, you were asking, Steve, what's something that folks don't know? Yeah, like, like, you yeah. know, some cool behind the scenes. And this is, again, maybe like a cheating answer, but I think what folks know, but I think it's important, is that we all really do enjoy each other. Um, I think, you know, Ron has said many times, and I'm going to mess up this quote, but something to the effect of, like, that the showrunner is the first among equals. And that doctrine has bled into every single thing we do for the last six years in making this show. And so whether it's like, you know, collaboration on set or conversations and fittings, like we all really enjoy each other's company. We really get on well. And I feel like it translates from the room through the show into the audience. I see like the folks on the Reddit forums and the conversations and they have their communities and their connections together and it just, it feels it's so kumbaya to say, but it feels like a family. And I think that that's cool. Don't you fucking laugh when I'm <laughs> saying about our family. Like you have family on Thanksgiving. Yeah. <laughs> you see what I have to deal with? On that note, I just want to point out that there's this thing called social media. And if you enjoy the show, please talk about it online, spread the love. Ladies and gentlemen, a huge thank you to Apple TV Plus for letting us do this, to the cast and creators. Thank, thank you, you so much. much for coming out, guys. We really, really thank appreciate it. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>